This Brigham Young University Idaho devotional address by Elder Peter M. Johnson, General Authority 70, was delivered March 14, 2023. Elder Peter M. Johnson was sustained as a General Authority 70 on April 6, 2019. At the time of his call, he had been serving as an Area 70 and a member of the 6th Quorum of the 70 in the North America Southeast area. He is currently serving as an Executive Director in the Missionary Department. Elder Johnson received received bachelor's and master's degrees in accounting from Southern University, Utah University. He received a PhD in accounting from Arizona State University. He began his career in 1992 as staff accountant for Grant Thornton, CPA. He has worked as an associate professor at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, Assistant Professor of Accountancy at Brigham Young University and Associate Professor of Accountancy at the University of Alabama. Elder Johnson has served in a number of church callings, including full-time missionary in the Alabama-Birmingham Mission, counselor in a bishopric, Ward Young Men President, Stake Financial Clerk, Ward Mission Leader, Stake President, and President of the England-Manchester Mission from 2020 to 2022. Peter Matthew Johnson was born in New York City, New York, on November 29, 1966. He married Stephanie Lynn Chadwick in 1990. They are the parents of four children. Thank you, that beautiful choir. I'm grateful to be here with President and Sister Irene, wonderful leadership of this wonderful campus. Sisters and brothers, thank you. Thank you for your faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your courage to stand as a witness of his name. And thank you for receiving ordinances and keeping your covenants as you become and help others to become true followers of Jesus Christ and enjoy the blessings of the Holy Temple. You are beautiful. You are loved. My friends, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I invite the Holy Ghost to be with us as we discuss the importance of applying the doctrine of Jesus Christ into our lives. Jesus Christ taught eternal truths, extended invitations to act, and promised blessings to those who acted in faith to fulfill his invitations. Using the Lord's pattern of instruction will help us to apply his doctrine more consistently and more intentionally into our lives and allow us to receive access to his atonement so that we can be endowed with heavenly power. This power helps us overcome challenges, heartaches, and disappointment and allow us to recognize the joys of our mortal journey to eternal life. President Russell M. Nelson declared, and I quote, there has never been a time in the history of the world when knowledge of our Savior is more personally vital and relevant to every human soul. The pure doctrine of Christ is powerful and helps us find and stay on the covenant path to receive all that God has because nothing can be worth more than all that our Heavenly Father has, close quote. My friends, we gain a knowledge of Jesus the Christ as we apply his doctrine into our lives. So how do we do it? How do we apply Jesus' doctrine into our lives? Well, first, we must understand the elements of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The doctrine of Jesus Christ is faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving a gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. Developing faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement starts with a desire to believe, followed by putting forth the effort required to know him. Faith is the principle of action and power. 
President Nelson taught, and I quote, faith in Jesus Christ is the foundation of all belief and the conduit of divine power. Everything good in life, every potential blessing of eternal significance begins with faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is the greatest power available to us in this life. All things are possible to him and to them that believe, close quote. And then President Nelson offers key suggestions of things that we can do to develop our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We must study his words and the words of his prophets and apostles. We need to become engaged learners as we immerse ourselves into the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon. We must choose to believe. Faith in Jesus Christ is, is a choice followed by an action that leads us to receiving his divine power. We must act in faith. I love what President Nelson has said. He said this, what would you do if you had more faith? Think about it, write about it, then receive more faith by doing something that requires more faith. And finally, President Nelson invited us to partake of sacred ordinances worthily. Ordinances unlock the power of God for, our, for your life. And then ask your Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ for help. Faith takes work. Receiving revelation takes work. God knows what will help us grow your faith. Ask and then ask again. Applying the doctrine of Jesus Christ in our life begins with having faith in him, believing him, and trusting him. At age 19, I was baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. A year later, I was called to serve as a missionary and assigned to labor in the Alabama-Birmingham mission. I loved and enjoyed my missionary experience, and it was the hardest thing I had done in my life to that point. As a new member of the church and serving as a missionary, I did not fully comprehend the doctrine of Jesus Christ, nor the history of the Lord's restored church. In about my fourth month of my missionary service, we taught a lesson to an individual who seemed to know more about the history of the church than me. The lesson was not spirit-filled nor spirit-led, and this individual made several accusations against the church and his teachings. At this point in my membership, I had never heard of such allegations. Please keep in mind that this was the day before Facebook, Instagram, Google, and Wikipedia. As my companion and I evaluated our conversation with this individual, I was informed that some of the things he mentioned was true. I had never heard in the past that priesthood and temple blessings was denied to black members. I was shocked at first, later confused, and then I felt betrayed. I have felt I had been lied to by my teachers and leaders when I joined the church. And thus, for the next two weeks, no significant missionary work was done. And yes, I continued to follow the daily schedule of missionary life and was obedient as best I could to the mission rules. However, because of the resentment I was feeling towards God and my lack of trust for people, I did not recognize the Holy Ghost in my life. Because of these feelings, I didn't want to speak to anyone, especially my companion. My companion recognized my frustrations and feelings of unhappiness. And at the end of each night, all that he would say to me was, Elder Johnson, I love you. He did not try to resolve my concerns, nor did he call the mission president. All he did was tell me that he loved me. And finally, after about two weeks, I started to believe him. His love softened my heart and gave me the courage to search the scriptures for answers that I desperately needed. I had stopped praying and reading the scriptures over these past two weeks. I was lost, felt alone, and was confused. Because I felt my companion's love, I began to feel God's love again. I was led by the Spirit to a place in the scriptures that I had never before read. The scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, verses 21 through 23, and reads as follows. Behold, 
I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I am the same that came into my own, and my own received me not. I am the light which shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth not. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know the truth concerning these things. Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? You may recall that these words were spoken through revelation to Oliver Cowdery in 1829. At the time, he served as a scribe during the translation of the Book of Mormon. Oliver, like me, may have been questioning his divine appointment. These few words spoken by Jesus Christ reminded me of the day that I had fasted and prayed to know if Jesus Christ was God's own son, if his words was found in the Book of Mormon, and if the Lord had called Joseph Smith as his prophet. Alone in my dorm room, I received a witness by the Holy Ghost of these sacred, sacred truths. I remembered. And as I remembered this experience in my missionary apartment in Alabama, I began once again to recognize the Holy Ghost in my life. It had never left me. Following this experience, I knelt to pray and express my gratitude and love to God. In doing so, I felt of his love and gratitude for me. My faith in Jesus was not only restored, but deepened. I knew that I had not been betrayed, nor have I been lied to, for God cannot lie. From that moment, I have tried to share with friends and families that God lives. Jesus is the Christ and the only begotten Son of a living God, and his church even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been restored on earth at this precious time to prepare you and me for the second coming of the Messiah. My friends, it is all true. And as we consistently and intentionally apply the doctrine of Jesus Christ in our lives, our faith in him will be deepened and we will recognize and receive his divine power. Faith in Jesus Christ, coupled with sincere repentance, provides access to his divine power. Repentance is to change. It is a process we experience as we become all that Heavenly Father desires us to become. The process of becoming better and more like God is made possible because of Jesus Christ. His suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross at Calvary enables us, if we choose, to experience the divine gift of forgiveness and receive his grace and power. Power to overcome temptations, power to forgive others, power to see others as God sees them, and power to see ourselves as God sees us. We are children of a loving Heavenly Father, and we possess divine attributes of deity, especially kindness. President Nelson taught us the most important truths and lessons. Too many people consider repentance as punishment, something to be avoided, except in the most serious circumstances. But this feeling of being penalized is engendered by Satan. He tries to block us from looking to Jesus Christ who stands with open arms, hoping and willing to heal, forgive, cleanse, strengthen, purify, and sanctify us. Nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular, daily focus on repentance. Repentance is not an event, it's a process. It is the key to happiness and peace of mind. I love those words spoken by our prophet of God. And then President Nelson has further declared that repentance is powerful 
because it brings God's power into our lives. My friends, if we truly understood the elements of repentance, we would run to it. It is wonderful, it is needed, it brings joy. Please, do not be afraid to repent. And do not let Satan rob you of the joy and the divine power you can have from Jesus as you choose to repent, choose to change, and choose to become. The elements of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost involves receiving ordinances and making and keeping covenants. Ordinances and covenants are prominent in the doctrine of Christ and allows the power of godliness to be manifest in our lives. President Nelson taught, and I quote, I grieve for those who leave the church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in the baptismal fonts and in the temple and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us, strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. Close quote. My friends, and with permission from my daughter, I would like to share the following. A few years ago, my daughter experienced a faith crisis. Whitney played NCAA Division I basketball and suffered a torn ACL in her freshman year. And just before the start of her sophomore year, she ruptured an Achilles tendon. Whitney worked through the rehabilitation process and decided to serve as a full-time missionary. She served faithfully for 18 months and returned home to complete her second full season of playing college basketball. At the end of the season, there was a change in the university coaching staff. Fortunately for Whitney, she had graduated with an undergraduate degree and still had two years to play college basketball. Thus, she transferred to another university to receive her master's degree and to play her last two seasons of college basketball. As a custom in our family, Whitney received the priesthood blessing at the start of the school year. As her father, I extended blessings with specific promises relating to Whitney's academic and athletic experiences I hoped she would receive in the upcoming school year. Whitney earned a starting position on the team and was having a good season, and the team was excited for the end of the year conference tournament. In one of the final two or three games of the year, before the conference tournament, Whitney suffered a knee injury. Immediately after the game, Stephanie and I spoke with Whitney on the phone, offering encouragement. During this phone call, Whitney expressed faith and trust in the Lord and believed the injury was not severe because of the priesthood blessing she had received at the start of the school year. Unfortunately, Whitney had suffered another torn ACL, this time in the other knee. Frustrations ensued. Questions of faith started to be expressed. How can Heavenly Father do this to me, Whitney said. I have been trying to keep all his commandments, including honoring the Sabbath day. And Dad, Dad, you bless me that I'll be okay physically. Why did the Lord do this to me. With love and prayers and seeking guidance from the Lord, Stephanie and I, all that we can say was, Whitney, we love you. God loves you. And no matter what has happened to you, please keep your covenants. Whitney reluctantly agreed to accept our invitation, but she was confused, frustrated, and upset. Whitney was determined to play her last year of college basketball and to receive her master's degree. She worked extremely hard at rehab in the off season with a great athletic trainer. Whitney returned for a last year to play college basketball and did not miss a game. And her athletic ability was so strong, it seemed as if she had never suffered two torn ACLs or had an eruptured Achilles tendon. 
She started every game, enjoyed the season, received her master's degree, and yet she was still confused and frustrated. Whitney accepted employment in a city where she knew there would not be many members of the church. Again, we as her parents knew of Whitney's frustrations and lovingly expressed our love for her and asked, no matter what you do, Whit, will you please continue to keep your covenants? This time, there was no commitment made. As Whitney settled into her new area, Stephanie and I made phone calls to assess how things were going and to get a sense of how to help Whitney spiritually. Finally, after a few months, it was decided that Stephanie and I needed to go and spend the weekend with our daughter. Whitney invited us to church. It was Fast Sunday. And as testimonies was being shared, Whitney walked up to the podium and shared a beautiful testimony of Jesus Christ and of his love for her. Yes, we were surprised, grateful, and tearful. What had happened, we wondered. Following the worship service and while having dinner at Whitney's apartment, we asked Whitney what had happened. And she shared the following, and I quote, Dad and Mom, when I arrived in this city, I was determined not to go to church. I was done with church. I was done with God. However, after learning that my roommate was a Relief Society president, <laughs> I decided to go to church. I felt it would be easier than getting my name on a list where people would feel forced to visit me and try to convince me to go back to church. I didn't want to draw attention to myself. I figured I can be inactive in the gospel while being present at church and no one would be the wiser. So I went to church. One particular Sunday, I walked in late, <clears throat> stayed to the end of the worship service and came home. Nothing happened that Sunday that was special, but beknownst to me, a member of the stake presidency had noticed me. He was at church that day, seated on a stand, and he saw me walk in. He later told me that the Lord told him at that moment that he, the Lord, had a work for me to do. This counselor was overwhelmed by the feelings he was having and shared these feelings with the, members of the, with the other members of the stake presidency. They counseled together and felt impressed to extend a call for me to serve as an early morning seminary teacher. A few weeks later, and before I knew about this proposed calling, I learned that a dear friend of mine was getting sealed in a temple. I hadn't attended the temple in a long time, and I didn't want to go and get my temple recommend, but I did want to be there for my friend. I decided to go through the process despite my continued frustration and confusion. And it just so happened that my temple recommend interview was with the member of the state presidency who had noticed me at church that one Sunday. Before he went through the temple recommend questions to assess my testimony and worthiness, he encouraged me to answer the questions as if I was speaking to the Savior himself. This got to me and I knew I could not lie. I told him directly that I was good with all the temple recommend questions that I had kept my covenants, except for questions one and two, I could not answer these questions. The first two questions of the temple recommend are, do you have faith in and a testimony of God the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And the second question reads as follows. Do you have a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ and of His role as your Savior and Redeemer? Whitney continues, the stake presidency member spoke to me with love. He saw a faith and a testimony in me that I didn't even know that I had. He saw the string of hope I was unknowingly clinging to, 
the one that kept me going to church even though I had no logical answer for why I continue to do so. Despite my struggles, I was called to serve as an early morning seminary teacher. The Lord knew of my struggles, so why would he want me to teach young people at 6 a.m. every morning? It was unfair and not right. The council and the stake presidency felt of my frustrations and returned to council with the other members of the stake presidency. Collectively, they still felt inspired to issue the call for me to serve as a seminary teacher. Whitney goes on. Reluctantly, I accepted this assignment. The first week of class was a disaster. I felt unqualified. I felt like an imposter. And after crying in my room, feeling like a failure, the following thought came to my mind. If I'm going to teach these young people about God and to have faith in Jesus Christ, then I must determine where my faith is. My daughter Whitney then shared how she immersed herself in the scriptures and began to pray daily and to live her covenants more fully, even without knowing why. Feelings of God's love for her returned, and her love for God renewed. Though Whitney still does not understand all things, I believe she has come to a powerful understanding that God lives, and Jesus is the Christ. As her parents, we believe Whitney recognizes that through all the trials that she had experienced and suffered, with two torn ACLs, an eruption Achilles tendon, mental and emotional challenges, and in not having all of her college aspirations fulfilled, the Lord did not abandon her. These challenges offered an opportunity for Whitney to be refined and transformed as she becomes all that Heavenly Father wants her to become and to know her Redeemer and Savior. My friends, there has never been a time in the history of the world when knowledge of our Savior is more personally vital and relevant to every human soul. So how was this refinement this transformation achieved for Whitney. I believe it was because Whitney kept her covenants amid all the discouragement, disappointments, and unfulfilled dreams. Whitney is endowed with his divine power, which in the beginning she didn't even, not, she didn't even recognize that she had. This power helped her overcome the temptations to flee and to give up on what she felt deep in her heart was true. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his power through their covenantal relationship with God. God lives. He loves his children. And all that he does for you and for me is for our benefit and is for our good. Those of you who may be going through unparalleled trials, those of you who feel you are in the depths of misery and despair, and I know it sounds trivial, I know it sounds trivial, and possibly even cruel for me to say, all that God does for you and for me is for our benefit. Similar to my daughter, you may be questioning your faith. How in the world can this be for my benefit? How does this show God loves me? To that I say that I love you. Whatever string of hope you're holding on to, whatever excuse keeps you close to your covenants, I plead with you as a father, a loving parent, a friend, and as a disciple of Jesus Christ, hold on. Hold on. Keep your covenants. And in time, you will, just like Whitney, just like me, will recognize his divine grace, his power, and his love. So, how do we apply the doctrine of Jesus Christ in our lives so that we can recognize his grace, we can recognize his power and his love? May I offer just three suggestions. First, we must be engaged learners. 
We must study the words of Christ written in the Holy Scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon, and from the words of his living prophets and apostles. President Nelson has shared this. The truths of the Book of Mormon have the power to heal, to comfort, to restore, to succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. As you prayerfully study the Book of Mormon every day, you will make better decisions every day. He then goes on and promised that as we study the Book of Mormon, the windows of heaven will open and you will receive answers to your own questions and direction for your own life. Second, we must receive ordinances and make and keep covenants. Ordinances and covenants connect us to Christ so that he can be connected to us. As we receive ordinances and make and keep covenants, Jesus Christ lifts us up above the pull of this falling world by blessing us with greater charity, humility, generosity, kindness, self-discipline, peace, and rest. And lastly, like Jesus Christ, we must minister to the one. The essence of ministering to the one is to understand and embrace and follow the two great commandments. Ministering is an important way we keep the commandments of God to love God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we minister to the one, we are helping others become true followers of Jesus Christ and enjoy the blessings of the Holy Temple. Ministering to others includes remembering people's names and becoming acquainted with them, loving them without judging them, and watching over them and strengthening their faith one by one as Jesus did. So how do we apply the doctrine of Jesus Christ into our lives? We become engaged learners. We receive ordinances as we make and keep covenants, and we minister to the one. As we consistently and intentionally apply the doctrine of Jesus Christ into our lives, I can promise you that you will have the strength to overcome temptations. You will find hope even amidst the challenges and disappointments. You will not be discouraged and you will feel the love of God in your life and know, my friends, that you are never, never alone. I leave with you my love, and at times my love is all I can give. And I leave unto you my witness that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information about this program, please visit the BYU-Idaho website at byui.edu devotionals.